it's a deliberately planned false flag or whether it is accidental or a blowback or an unintended consequence, it's always used to expand the state. Welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Our mission is to bring you great interviews with preppers from around the world so you can be better informed and better prepared for everything from a hurricane to the end of the world as we know it. I've personally been buying gold and silver from JM Bullion for over two years. They offer the best prices over spot that I can find, and I've never had a problem with an order. If you're looking to trade in some of your fiat paper for real money, check out jmbullion.com today. Hey, preppers and patriots. This is my interview on the Catherine Albright Show with Dr. Catherine Albright, and we'll talk a lot about the seven-step survival plan in this show. So it's a great show and a great refresher course for uh, the old pros that have been prepping for a long time, it'll help keep you balanced and uh, keep you from getting tunnel vision in one specific area. And for the new folks that are just joining us and just waking up to the need to prepare, uh, it's a great primer for you. So enjoy the show. But we haven't talked much about what what I suppose in the popular vernacular is known as uh, the prepper movement. And this is really about being self-sufficient, about making sure that you're not so dependent on the infrastructure that's out there, the supermarkets, the um, the transportation, the medicine, the all the things that we take for granted in our modern society, the electricity, the flowing water, the heat, and making sure that if those things ever go away, and we've certainly seen them go away many times in, in recent years in many parts of the country, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, um, all sorts of things have, have happened to make people uh, have to really think about their self-sufficiency. There is obviously a movement underway for people to become completely self-sufficient. I know the Mormons have to stock up two years of food for whatever eventuality may come down the pike. I know that even the emergency folks at FEMA tell you you need to have a couple of days or even a couple of weeks worth of self-sufficiency stored up. Well, I'm not too up on these things, but I've invited a guest on the program who is an expert in these things. Mark Goodwin joins us. He's a Christian constitutional author. He's also the host of the popular Prepper Recon podcast. He interviews patriots, preppers, and economists each week on PrepperRecon.com to help people prepare for everything from a hurricane to the end of the world as we know it. Mark Goodwin, welcome to the program. Hello. Dr. Albright, it's such an honor to be on your show. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's great to have you on, and you can just call me Catherine. I'm on your website, PrepperRecon.com, and when I think Prepper, I'm thinking sort of bug out bag, I'm thinking food, emergency food storage, I'm thinking water filtration. What else should I be thinking in terms of, of, of what sorts of preparation we need? And, and let me preface this by saying I think it's interesting that the government is really encouraging us to become self-sufficient in these ways and is also supporting this movement. So if you've got the government um, saying, hey, we can't care for you in the event things go bad, then maybe we ought to be taking these things seriously. So what exactly is the prepper movement? Is it all a bunch of people who want to go live out in the woods and, and live on a compound and arm themselves to the teeth? Or is this regular people living in the suburbs, living in cities, living all around the country who just want to use their common sense and make sure they're not caught um, with, without being prepared. Well, it, you mentioned in the in the beginning of the show that FEMA recommends that you have two or three days. And then you also mentioned sort of the, the folks that have completely went off grid and, you know, they've got solar and they're doing everything themselves and uh, they haven't seen another human being in the last eight years. So maybe somewhere in between there is probably the prepper movement because, uh, you know, it's not really all about completely cutting yourself off from society. And then it's not all about, you know, then it's, I don't think that two or three days is really going to cut it either. Uh, two or three days might do it for a light hurricane, but as we've seen with Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, um, earthquakes, fires, these types of things, uh, you know, people can be cut off without systems of support for extended periods of time, two, three, four weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, the, some of the things that we're doing in our uh, our nation's uh, capital, especially with the Federal Reserve and some of the things they're doing with the, the money supply, um, are creating more and more instability in the system. And uh, and just our system in general is so complex. And the more complex you have in a, a, 
of a system, the more possible points of failure you introduce into that system. And so things can go bad, and they can go really bad for a long time. And it can be natural disasters. And, uh, of course, we've seen in, in Russia in the 90s and in Argentina in 2001 um, that uh, you know currencies don't always last either. Um, the dollar in its present fiat form's only been around since 1970, so or 1971 rather. So, um, and its days may be numbered. So, uh, it's just, it just makes sense to be prepared to get by without those systems of support. And and you're right. It's it's food it's food storage. It's water storage. Um, security is one of the things you have to think about. In the the Ferguson riots, you know, we saw the police just absolutely stand down because they were overwhelmed. There was there was more than what they could contend with, and so at that point, they just have to stand aside and kind of let things happen and and go fill out a report afterwards. Which in 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 normal day to day life, that's really the best you can ask. You can't expect a police officer, nor would we want them to be, in our home twenty four hours a day. Uh, if there's an intruder or whatever, you need to be able to take care of yourself on some level because the best they can do is come fill out a report after the crimes occurred. Right. Now, before we before we get into this, I just want to tell my story of having lived through the L.A. Rodney King riots. And I was, at that time, I, my listeners know this, I was a completely clueless, like, supporting Handgun Control, Inc., and voting for Barbara Boxer and Diane Feinstein. I mean, I was about as clueless of a Southern California airhead as a person could possibly be. And I, I really changed my tune when the L.A. riots hit, because what happened was, we, we all know the story, um, the, 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 the decision came down, and there were riots in response to a failure to prosecute people who I, I think clearly had, had been in the wrong, some police who um, did some terrible things. And when the riots hit, I was living in a, a, a suburb of Los Angeles, and I was living in a pretty good part of town. And when those riots hit, they took over all of Los Angeles County, all the way up through my little urban or uh, suburban community. And the, the riots were so extreme and so bad. I don't think they really hit the, 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 the news, um, just what we lived through. In fact, I think much of what we experienced has never been reported on. But I, I've told the story before. My mother went to pick up a prescription for my 80-some-year-old grandfather and left him in the car with the engine running because of the heat um, with the air conditioner. And when she was in the store, a bunch of uh, people with bandanas over their faces came in with baseball bats and maybe guns. She doesn't know. They made everyone lie on the floor. So here's my mother literally lying on the floor as they went through and they smashed all the cases. They took all the cameras, all the jewelry, all the electronics at this um, uh, drugstore kind of place that she was. And she was in, in fear that she would get outside and find that they had driven away in her car, which was running with the car with the key in the engine and make off with not only the car, but, but my grandfather. And so she was very shaken, terrified, came out to the parking lot, so relieved to see he was there. But this kind of thing was not even reported. In fact, this crime, we went through the crime logs, and we never even found a report of this particular crime. So the, the point that I'm making here is when things get out of control, the police do stand down. There's no, there's no way that you were going to report that particular incident with 5,000 other incidents happening and, and have anyone respond to it. I mean, you were really at the mercy of what was going on there. And the other story that I tell, Mark, which I think is even more relevant to preparation, is when the riots were going on, the, the, the air filled with smoke because they had set a tennis shoe company on fire, and so all the rubber soles were burning. The whole entire sky was black. And we were actually worried that as the infrastructure broke down, we may not be able to get water. And in Southern California, it's really a desert. If you didn't irrigate it, there's no water there at all. And within a matter of days, you would be dead. I mean, there's literally nothing to drink, no, no water in the ground, in the sky, nowhere. So um, one of the things that, that they were advising on television was make sure that you stock up on food because who knows what's going to happen. So I hop in my car, I'm 20-something. I hop in my car and I go to this nice little supermarket down the street and I find that the supermarket has a line and they're letting people in one at a time. They've got security guards there. They're letting people in like in groups of three into the store. So there's this big line. I get in the line and they let us in the store one by one. Finally, I get to my turn and when I went into the store, the only thing available to buy in the store were plastic forks and cat litter. That was it. Everything else, all the canned food gone. 
all the bottled water, I'm sure one of the first things to be snapped up, all everything was gone. There was no food in that store to be had. And, you know, as I'm looking around and I'm like, well, what am I going to do with motor oil and cat litter and light bulbs? <laughs> I left and I thought, boy, I need to be prepared. So you're the expert. You're going to tell us what I should have done differently and what I should have had on hand in Southern California to live through those riots and help our listeners know what they need going forward. All right, stay tuned. We're with Mark Goodwin, Prepper Recon. Stay tuned. All right, we're back. You know that that thing about talking on cell phones to one another. If you notice that young people don't talk on cell phones at all, they just text one another. In fact, it seems like we've gotten to the point where people really don't want to talk face-to-face. They don't want to talk on the phone. They don't really want to talk in any kind of context. Let's hope that you're the exception to the rule. Put down the phone. Talk to the people you love. All right, this hour we're talking about preparedness. How can you prepare your family, whether you live in the city, the country, out on a farm somewhere, maybe in a suburban area. Mark Goodwin joins us this hour. His um, specialty is helping people to prepare. His website is PrepperRecon.com. And I was telling the story about my experience during the L.A. riots in which it, it really did change my understanding of how the world works because there's certain things you take for granted. And when there are riots, when society breaks down, you are amazed at how thin that veneer of common courtesy and law abidingness really is and you become aware that all it takes is just one tiny little spark to strip it away and then your life can change literally overnight so anyone who's lived through a riot has experienced this i'm sure people living through natural disasters have experienced a different version of it because i've heard that people tend to kind of try to help each other out during a riot it's really every man for himself and you can't trust anybody and I remember sitting in my home with my cat litter and plastic forks. No, I didn't buy them. I just sat in my home with like one day's worth of food rotting in my fridge, basically. Well, the power was still on, but it would have been rotting. And I had a baseball bat across my lap. I remember sitting on the floor with the curtains drawn, my door locked and dead bolted, and watching the riots on TV with nothing in my lap but a baseball bat. I didn't own a gun. I didn't own anything. And I remember thinking to myself, if these roving bands of thugs that have already uh, assaulted my mother, that, it, that are making their way through our communities that I'm seeing on TV, if they come to my home, they will break the window and come in my house. I can't keep them out. And this baseball bat is not going to stop a guy with a gun. What am I going to do? So fortunately, we did not run out of food. Uh, they were able to send in the National Guard and restore some semblance of order, but it was one of the scariest things I've ever been through. Mark Goodman, Goodwin, what, what could I have done? How could I have been more prepared? How, how can I prevent ever having to live through an experience like that again? And there's no way to stop those types of experiences. They're, they're going to happen. They've always happened through, through time, and it's just going to come. And the best thing you can do for it is prepare. And, uh, um, and if you don't have a good recipe for cat litter casserole, I guess uh, the next best <laughs> thing is going to be uh, my seven-step uh, survival plan. I'm writing a book on that right now. It's going to be my seventh book, and that will probably be out at the end of this summer. But uh, I'll just go through sort of the, the two-minute version of it. Uh, might be a little longer than two minutes, but we'll try. Uh, and the first thing is probably not the first thing that – that people are going to think of, but step number one, and I've I've titled them all with a, a B letter word, so it's kind of easy to remember. Uh, but step number one in the seven step survival plan is body, mind, and soul, because you are your number one survival tool. And it sounds like you were sort of on the right track for doing the best that you could do with uh, what you had to work with and where you were at at the time. You know, you turned on the television, you you got sit sit situational awareness, you got some information about what was going on, uh, you armed the, yourself the best you could with a ball bat, you locked the doors, um, you closed the, the, the curtains so that no light was going out, which we call that in the, in the preparedness community, we would call that light discipline, that that you're not letting anybody know that there's anybody inside and there's there's no sound going outside and you're not outside uh, yakking on the phone and with your door wide open and showing that, that you're a target. So uh, 
I would say for for what you had at the time, you probably did the best thing you possibly could have done with uh, you know getting situational awareness, locking the doors, light discipline, and and just preparing yourself mentally to do whatever you had to do. Even if you knew you were going to lose, you were going to try. You weren't just going to roll over and die. So uh, maintaining that fighter spirit, but that's all sort of uh, part of who you are, and that's that's sort of that by, body, mind, and soul, uh, the first step, and. Uh, for body, one of the best things you can do is to be in shape, uh, eat healthy, get rid of any addictions that are going to slow you down in a, in a collapse or any type of a crisis scenario. Um, we had the terrible snowstorms this last winter, and especially up in your neck of the woods. Uh, it started early and ended late. I think you got started up around November. and uh, We still have two feet of snow in our yard, so we've just been hammered. Yeah, it's and you been, still it's been have brutal. It. You still yeah. have it. I think there was. I think there was a story about a lady going to the doctor on a on a garbage truck. Yeah, that was me. I, <laughs> I actually went to um, I went to my neurosurgery in a snowplow because there was no other way to get down there. The, the ambulance wouldn't take me in in the uh, in the blizzard. So yes, I guess that's emergency preparedness in its own way. Um, and I had a 11 hour neurosurgery that I probably would have died had I not gotten. So yes, we we that's resourcefulness. And I think that's that's one element of what you're talking about, the mind, body, and spirit. You say, well, what do you mean you can't take me to my surgery? I, I'm going to find a way to get there no matter what. So I think a lot of it is just, just a tenacity and a desire to, to survive, regardless of what's going on around you. And I'll, I'll say the hurricane, the, hurricane the, the blizzard really was a natural disaster. I mean, everything was shut down. The roads were closed. We were... Um, told that it was a, a, a state emergency, a federal emergency had been declared, and we were told not to leave our homes. So I, I guess I've lived through two of those now. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, we had so many people this year killing over dead of heart attacks out shoveling snow, you know, because they had they had snow on their roofs. You had to get up mm. and, and shovel the snow off your roof before your your roof collapses. And uh, and these people have been sitting on the, the couch eating potato chips, watching Oprah for the past uh, 11 months, or maybe they didn't even have snow the, the, the year before and, uh, you know, maybe even longer. So they're getting out doing really strenuous exercise that their body's not used to. And the same thing happens down in my neck of the woods in Florida when hurricanes blow through because they haven't done any really hard manual labor for a long time. They're in very poor cardiovascular health. And then they get out there with a the chain star and, chainsaw and start trying to cut up trees and and they kill over dead from a heart attack and we had lots of those this year and it, it killed more people than the snow what it what it what a tragic thing to die of a heart attack when when <laughs> when when you have bigger fish to fry all right stay tuned we'll be right back with mark goodwin we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back katie armor offers affordable body armor including level three trauma plates made of ar500 steel they can endure multiple rounds from pistols and rifles up to 7.62 NATO. Their plates are available with Rhino Linings coatings to reduce spa. Go to katiearmor.com. That's C-A-T-I armor.com today. When disaster strikes, it's too late to prepare. PrepperRecon.com offers Molly compatible individual first aid kits for your home, auto, or bug out bag. These kits have everything you need to address a traumatic injury, including an Israeli battle dressing, quick cloth, EMT shears, suture kit, stera strips, tourniquet, ACS chest seal, tough strip bandages, gauze, and so much more. $89 includes shipping. To buy your individual first aid kit, go to PrepperRecon.com and click the store tab at the top of the homepage. Order today before it's too late. Mind, body, and soul. Exercise, eating right, conquering addiction, learning, adding to your skills, and I would add keeping that survivor mentality, really. I think there's a big element in an emergency of clear-headedness and a decision that you're not going to give up. And uh, oftentimes people who start, who freeze to death or um, uh, people have been found in New Hampshire up here in New England, literally a, a block away from their home, but they just gave up and lied down and said, forget it, I'm not going to make my way back when they found themselves out in the cold. So I think there really is an element of just saying, no matter what happens, I'm going to get through this. And preparation is a big part of feeling confident that you'll be able to do that. So let's let's go on to our um, our, our next step here. We were talking about um, being ready by mind, body, and soul. Um, a budget, and you've got the bees here, and a bug out bag. Let's talk about those. 
And then real quickly before we go on to, to step number two, the, the last part of step number one was soul because uh, I think that folks need to consider what's going to happen on that day that they finally do die because um, statistics say 10 out of 10 people die. And um, <laughs> and I think yes, anybody indeed. anybody that calls herself a prepper should be considering that day because it is so inevitable. And I believe that the Bible proves that faith in Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And the sur- the subject certainly worth thinking over. And it's not something that you want to be wrong about. And it's something that you want to think about now while you have that time because uh, we we hear a lot of stories from troops that that they'll be in a fire they'll be getting ready to go into their first firefight and they start thinking about that they start thinking about, um, am I going to live through this? What's going to happen when I die? It's so much easier to go through something like that if you already have that peace of knowing that you're going to spend eternity with Christ prior to going into the situation. And uh, and thinking about it right before that situation is, is the worst possible time. So think about that now while you have time. And then, like you said, step number two is a budget. And that's not really like the big sexy thing that people think about when they think about prepping, you know, all the, the beads and the bullets and the Band-Aids and all of that stuff. Um, but it's I think it's the second most important thing. Once you've got yourself uh, squared away and you're in decent shape and you know where you're going when you die and uh, you've gotten rid of the addictions and you're kind of training your mind, you're learning skills and uh, teaching yourself to, to think uh, uh, proactively like you did when you were in that situation. Um, I think the, bed, the budget's the next most important thing because uh, I think it was 2012 and I can't remember the magazine, but there was a magazine that cited that 40% of Americans have less than $500 in the bank. And they're they're in an economic collapse right now themselves. They've got credit card bills that they can't pay. They've got a mortgage they can't pay, um, and they're they're living on more than than they're bringing in. And you have to get on a budget. And uh, I've got some links over at PrepperRecon.com that take people over to some different budgeting sites. One is uh, Dave Ramsey's site. He's got some really good online budgeting forms that you can just fill in. How much am I bringing in every month? How much am I spending every month on on uh, rent, on the uh, insurance, on uh, food and electricity and cable? And what are those things can I cut out? And which of those things can I reduce? And uh, and can I start using some coupons to to cut back my my food cost? And all of those things are going to help you to build up an emergency fund so that when you have your own little personal crisis, and we all have them, whether it's a, a flat tire or a, a, a illness in the family or a broken leg or whatever it happens to be, we all have those crises. And they're so much easier to get through uh, if you're not already stressed out about money because you know you can't miss one day of work because you just don't have the money. You're living hand to mouth. So uh, I think that's so important. And if we do have a, a deeper crisis in America, uh, if things do fall apart, you're going to need whatever cushion you can have. And a lot of people think, oh, well, the dollar's not going to be worth anything anyway. Well, it will be at first. And then once it's not, then you're going to need some other a- tradable assets on hand to have instead of dollars to bring you through to the other side or preserve whatever wealth you've managed to, to save uh, to the other side. And then number three you mentioned uh, is the bug out bag. Sometimes things just go wrong right in your immediate area. Sometimes we'll have chemical spills or uh, or sometimes those hurricanes, they'll just take a, a, a real sharp turn and they'll start heading in a different direction than any of the forecast models predicted. And you'll have hours to get out of your location. And everybody else in your city is going to have the same hours to get out of the location. So uh, in a lot of those instances, you're going to be the first one on the road or you're going to be stuck in a parking lot. Because you, most major cities, they can't handle the rush hour traffic. So uh, much less every, cit- every citizen in the, in the city trying to evacuate at the same time. So a bug out bag is a good thing to have. And the bug out bag, we'll get in a little deeper on that. But what it is, is it's a 72 hour kit. It's got enough stuff in it to sustain you for 72 hours. So the things that you need to sustain you, you need food. So uh, you're going to have maybe some snack bars, pop tarts. Um, this is a good place to buy maybe some good MRE, some uh, meals ready to eat, uh, either the civilian models or um, they have they have the, the government issued 
MREs available for civilian com consumption. You can purchase those online as well. But these are really, really expensive ways to, to purchase storable food. And so they kind of make sense for the bug out bag, but for long term storage, unless you've got a huge budget for this, uh, there's some much cheaper ways to, to have storable food besides that. But uh, you want enough food in there to, to last you for 72 hours, and you just get a calculator, and you figure how many calories you need per day, and you times that by three, and that's how much food you need to put in there. And this is going to be one of those areas that you're not necessarily looking for uh, the light version of whatever, you know, the the uh, the canned fruit with no with no yeah. syrup, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, and this this is the time that you that you want the the Chef Boyardee raviolis because they're high in fat, they're high in carbs, they're everything that you usually don't want to be eating because you're storing a whole lot of energy in a small amount of space, and and that's getting more bang for your buck in that in that bug out bag, and and those canned pastas are great because you don't have to heat them up, you can just open them up with a can opener. You want to make sure you got a can opener in your bug out bag, and you can just eat them straight out of the can. Um, you're going to want some type of shelter and uh, a tent a regular tent is really big and it's really heavy but you can get a little bivy tents and uh and it's enough space for two people or if you're if you're good at uh in, in, you're good at uh, setting up shelters outside um a tarp might do it but if you're going to do a tarp then you want to make sure that you practice with that and you learn how to set that up because um shelter is one of the things especially in your area where it gets really cold that you won't last too long without some form of shelter. And if you have to leave your house and everybody else has to leave their house, there's a really good chance that all the hotels are going to be booked up. So you may end up in a campground. You may end up on the side of the road. It depends on what the disaster is. Um, sometimes it can just be a house fire and you've got that, you've got that bug out bag and you've got three days worth of food, some shelter, a change of clothes and all your, your personal information on a flash drive. And you can just grab that thing and go. And so okay. sometimes that's what the that's what the emergency is. Uh, one of the other things that you want in there, uh, water. Now water is really heavy to carry, but a good water filter uh, like a Ketadine or a Life Straw is going to let you filter water from just about any source and and have water. So you don't have to carry around se uh, seventy two hours worth of water if you've got maybe uh, a few bottled waters in there. And, and then some means of, of collecting water and some means of purifying it. So uh, that'll take care of that. And uh, I mentioned a change of clothes. Uh, that's a good thing to have, especially if you live in a, in a colder climate. You want to make sure you've got some warm weather gear in there. I recommend having some, some source, a couple of sources of being able to create a fire. Uh, a fire does a couple of things. You can cook your food on it. You can purify your water over it if you've got if you've got a metal container. Um, and it's also a good way to keep away the critters if you're having to to camp out because they don't like to be around that. And depending on which area of the country you're in, uh, there's a lot of critters around sometimes. Yeah, I was just rereading White Fang, and he the those guys survived several days with fire against the wolves that wanted to eat them. All right, stay tuned. We'll be right back. And of them, we've gone through body, mind, and soul. Stay healthy. Get rid of addictions. Budget. Make sure that you're prepared, that you're not hugely in debt like so many people. Uh, your bug out bag to survive 72 hours. Steps four, five, six, and seven. Let's see if we can get through this in this last segment, Mark. Uh, beans, bullets, bullion, and bug out location. Let's talk about each of those in turn. Yeah, beans is our, our B letter word, and that just kind of encompasses all food storage. Now, there's a, f a few good things that store really easy uh, that that will last a long time. Honey is one of the things that will last just about forever. They found honey in the in the pyramids in Egypt, and it was still edible. Um, rice wow. and beans will store. Uh, rice will store for about 20 years. Now, that's white rice, and I lo know a lot of people like to eat brown rice because it's healthier, but brown rice still has the bran on the outside of it, and the bran has uh, actually amino acids and fats in it that will actually rot and, and go rancid. Uh, it will store for about a year, uh, maybe two, if you've got it in, in, in proper conditions. But uh, white rice will last for about 20 years, and uh, beans will last for about 10 years, depending on which variety. Black beans and red beans are real resilient. They store really well. The dried beans and um, 
and you can store a lot of those. And you can just take a, a, a mylar bag, which is it's the stuff that they make the, the hot air balloons out of, the helium balloons out of that they sell at the dollar store, sort of this shiny metal stuff. You can order that at Amazon.com or uh, or uh, different survival uh and preparedness suppliers will will sell that, and you can take one of those, stick it in a five gallon bucket, put a twenty pound bag of rice in there, and then put ten pounds of of a variety of dried beans in there, and you've got enough food for a couple of weeks in there for one person, and seal that up, and uh, it'll cost you about twenty bucks to put together because uh, a twenty pound bag of rice is about seven bucks at Walmart, and a bag of dried beans is around a dollar. So with the Mylar liner, and uh, th- since you've got that liner, it's it's impermeable to to uh, any type of chemicals that might have been in the bucket. So you know it could be an old paint bucket, could be anything. It doesn't have to be food grade since it's in that Mylar liner. And uh, seal that off and stick it under your bed, stick it in your shed, wherever, and uh, and forget about it for twenty bucks. That's that's a lot of food that you've been able to store. So it doesn't have to be expensive. Pasta sauce, pasta. Uh, those are really good storable items. They last a long time, and it's easy to make. Uh, canned meat. Um, baking soda is a good thing to stockpile because if you put a tablespoon of baking soda in your dried beans when you're soaking them, because you usually have to soak those overnight and then you cook them the next day, uh, it will it will reduce the cooking time to about 45 minutes or an hour instead of two hours. So uh, usually in a survival situation, you're really concerned about not using too much fuel so that'll help you conserve your fuel by having that baking soda mixed in with your beans when you soak them and it's about a tablespoon for for a pound of dried beans and uh, you want to make sure you've got some way to cook all of that so it might be a camping stove or a solar oven uh, or just making sure that you've you've got some uh, resources around to build a campfire that's probably going to be the the toughest mean for people that are in a, an urban area so they're going to be uh, really sh- want to really be sure that they've got a camping stove or a solar stove or some way to to do their cooking without a fire if if they don't have the resources to go out and collect wood or whatever um, and then bullets, and then that's just our B letter word for for making sure you've got some way other than a baseball bat <laughs> yes. to, to defend yourself uh, when uh, the next series of race riots breaks out in in your hometown. And uh, uh, there's going to be uh, as many different opinions as there are people on what's the best gun and in and all of that. Uh, the, a few of the prepper favorites are going to be. Uh, a shotgun because a shotgun is very universal. It's a great home defense tool. Um, when you're thinking about home defense, you always want to be aware of what's on the other side of the wall where I'm shooting because drywall does not shot. It doesn't stop buckshot. It doesn't stop nine millimeter. It doesn't stop two twenty three. It doesn't stop anything. So if your if your spouse or your child is on the other side of that wall, you might want to think twice about taking that shot in a defensive situation and do whatever you have to do to maneuver your your the predator away. Uh, to make sure that, that you've got a clear shot and what's beyond what you're shooting at is, is not going to be one of your loved ones or one of your neighbors either. So, uh, but a shotgun's a great thing for that because, um, you do get a nice spread on that. And then it's also good that, uh, you, you could use it for hunting if you're in a, a long-term survival situation where you might have to go out and, and hunt for small game. Uh, you can use it for self-defense and for hunting. So, I mean, if you were only going to get one firearm, I would say that the shotgun is probably the best thing to do. Um, second, after that, you probably want something that's small and concealable in case you do have to bug out and you do have to move. Uh, so your next thing is probably going to be a pistol and Glock is, typically been one of the most um, uh, reliable handguns for the money. You can pay a little bit more for something like an HK. Uh, you'll probably pay almost double for that, but for around 500 bucks, you can get a good uh, Glock, and that's what a lot of police and military carry, so uh, that's a very reliable uh, firearm. And you want to make sure that you've got the ammunition to train with these because a gun doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you don't know how to use it. So when you get your gun, you want to take it to the range, get some training with it. Uh, if you get the pistol and you live in a, in a, in a state that allows it, get your concealed carry uh, permit and, and, and learn how to use it and make sure you get enough ammo to store, make sure you get enough ammo to train with. So uh, that'll take care of your security. You'll be better secured. And I did write a book. It's called Retreat Security and Small Unit Tactics. And I wrote that with David Kobler. He, he has the Southern Prepper 1 YouTube channel on YouTube. And he's, uh, 
he was the infantry in, in Iraq and we wrote that together and it's a little bit more comprehensive on some things that you can do to to have security for your home and also organize your community to to have its own security force for when things really go bad and then step number six is bullion uh you know if we have a currency collapse silver and gold have historically always been money uh, i think it's genesis 13 two i want to say uh, Abraham was wealthy in cattle and silver and gold and U.S. dollars. And I bet you, <laughs> I bet you wouldn't need more than two tries to figure out which one of those doesn't belong. <laughs> yes, indeed. And, and so it's always been money. And, uh, and so it's got a much better track record than, than the U.S. dollar. And for that, I recommend, uh, you know, staying with smaller units so that it's divisible in case you need it for a barter situation, which one ounce silver coins or one ounce silver bars are great for, uh, small trade. And then, um, and then, uh, one ounce gold coins are great for long term wealth preservation. Um, and, and I, I stick to the silver for divisibility rather than trying to get the smaller denominations of the gold because, uh, you pay a higher premium when you start getting into a fractional gold coins, uh, much higher premium than, than what you pay for the one ounce gold coins. And, and I stick to bullion. I don't get into numismatic coins either. And, uh, and so that'll guarantee that you've got some type of wealth preservation through the collapse. And there's other things that work for barter as well. You know, anything, especially my wife's a big couponer, so she gets tons of free stuff from, from CVS every, every week. There, she's coming in with a couple of bags full of free stuff that she gets from CVS and it's through their, their rewards program where it's basically when you buy something, you get back CVS bucks for, uh, for the same amount that you just spent, and then you can just go buy some whatever the the deal is next week with that. One week it might be toothpaste, the next week it might be uh, dental floss, and a week after that it might be hair coloring or shampoo, and and so we just stock up all of that stuff. And if we ever have a, a currency collapse, that's going to be tradable stuff, and that's going to be stuff that that people will be willing to barter for because it won't be available in the stores because there'll be no credit cards and no money, so there will be no right. stores. And you know, then, so much more we we could talk about. Where can people find your information online and your podcast if they'd like to learn more? That it's PrepperRecon.com, and then it's also on uh, YouTube. We we uh, replicate all of our our shows to uh, to Prepper Recon on on YouTube, and we put out two podcasts a week. And you'll be you'll be the guest on an upcoming show, of course. And it's every Monday and Wednesday, and that's downloadable. You can put it on your MP3. And I also wrote uh, some some preparedness uh, fiction books as well. It kind of helps people think about what it would be like. The first one was the Economic Collapse Chronicles. And then my new series is called The Days of Noah. And that sort of looks like looks at what it'll be like if, if uh, modern day conspiracies sort of tie into uh, biblical prophecy. And those are both great reads right. and we'll, fun. We'll post links to all of that on my website for our Goodwin State. In the Days of Noah, Book 2, Persecution by best-selling author Mark Goodwin. A globalist conspiracy transpires by way of a false flag attack against America's energy infrastructure. Noah and Cassandra Parker witness a complete economic meltdown, which is intentionally triggered by the event. The assault is blamed on patriots and Christians who are rounded up into detention centers across the country. Noah and his friends must take action to prepare for the meltdown and defend against the totalitarian regime, which is gunning for their freedom and, quite possibly, their very lives. Get your copy of The Days of Noah, Book 2, Persecution for Kindle, paperback or audio edition at Amazon.com today.